everyone. Uh, we are blessed to be here with uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi. Um, so, Bhante, thank you so much for, for joining us. I'll just read a quick biography. So, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi is an American Buddhist monk from New York City. He obtained a BA in philosophy from Brooklyn College and a PhD in philosophy from Claremont Graduate School. Bhikkhu Bodhi traveled to Sri Lanka where he received ordinations and held positions as president and editor of the Buddhist Publication Society. He is known for his work as the editor, compiler, translator of several discourse collections of the Pali Canon. In 2001, he returned to the U.S. and founded Buddhist Global Relief, a nonprofit organization supporting hunger relief, sustainable agriculture, and education in impoverished countries. Currently residing at Zhuangyan Monastery in Carmel, New York, he continues to teach Pali and Dhamma. So, thank you, Bhante. Um, so, just jumping in, just before we started, uh, we were speaking with Bhante uh, about the classes which he teaches on uh, the Satipatthana Sutta commentary. And um, Bhante, I'm curious what what insights you've gained. You mentioned, um, you know, maybe when you were a younger monk that uh, there was this ethos among Western monks, perhaps, that the commentaries could just be, quote, fuel for the fire, you know, this kind of dismissive attitude about the commentaries. And I'm curious what what have you learned from studying the commentaries? Okay, the, the commentaries set out to accomplish several projects. First, we have, of course, as the foundation for the, actually for all the Buddhist traditions are the canonical discourse collections, which are ascribed to the Buddha and to his eminent disciples. Then the commentaries are an attempt to explicate the suttas using different methodologies. And I would say that the methodologies that the commentaries use might be distinguished into two broad categories. One is the explanation of the wording. And the second is the explanation of the meaning. So there's a technical terms for these in Pali. One would be, I think, Padda Vanana, which is the explanation of the terminology. And the other is Atta Vanana, explanation of the meaning. So in the explanation of the terms of terminology, what the commentaries do is to go through the important wording in the sutta and then explain the meaning of those words. Often there are words that are used in the discourses that are maybe not so familiar. And so it will uh, explain them in terms of other words that are more familiar. But even the basic words, it will explain the derivation of those words and will lay down sometimes a string or series of synonyms to draw out the meaning of those words. Just to take a very simple example, say the word kanda, when we always we often speak about the panchupadana kanda, the five clinging aggregates. So we have the word kanda, which the commentary might say this word kanda is used in a number of contexts with different meanings. So we could have kanda as a collection of firewood, kanda as the trunk of a tree, kanda as the shoulder of an elephant. But then in relation to the five aggregates, it will say that here the meaning of kanda is rasi. Rasi means a collection. And so we see that when the text speaks about the five pancha kanda, it's speaking about five collections. Okay, say so just to give another example, let's see the word brahmacharya. Okay, so the text might take the word brahmacharya and say, okay, we have this word brahmacharya. Sometimes it means celibacy. So it means, I think in that sense, we're called metuna, metuna virati. So abstaining from sexual activity. In another context, it will say brahmacharya means observing the opposite day by lay people. In another context, brahmacharya means the path, the mugga, the noble, or the, the aryo atangiko mugo, the noble eightfold path. In still another context, brahmacharya means the entire teaching. I think the expression is sakalang sasanang, sakala sasanang, the entire sasana. Okay, so this is showing again the different uses of a term 
in different contexts so that you don't mix up the meaning of the term from one context in a different context, which is, is not the relevant one. Okay, so this takes care of the explanation of terminology. And the other point, or the other project of the commentaries is the explanation of the meaning, and that is to draw out, let's say, to, to draw out the doctrinal meaning of a passage, a term, a concept. And here the commentaries bring in like certain frameworks for interpreting the, the suttas. And I'm speaking about the sutta commentaries. Of course, there's commentaries to the Vinaya, commentaries to the Abhidhamma, but the sutta commentaries will have different interpretative schemes through which you're able to look at the sutta. And it helps one to see what I found especially beneficial in studying the commentaries is it helps one to appreciate what I would call the integral consistency and the integral consistency of the teachings laid out in the suttas and to get quite a comprehensive perspective on the teaching. So you can see that, get a, a kind of global picture of the entire teaching and where any particular discourse of the Buddha or any particular statement within the discourse of the Buddha, where it fits into in the entire framework of the teaching. So those are just some of the benefits that I've got, got gotten from studying the commentaries. And I don't, I have to say also add to this that I am not a commentarial fundamentalist. I don't take the position that the commentaries are beyond criticism, beyond questioning, that they have to be accepted and subscribed to 100%. If you look, I've seen some people say about, about Bhikkhu Bodhi that, quote, he's a slave of the commentaries. <laughs> not in any way the case. If you look at the notes to my tra published translations, you'll see often I do give the explanation. I say the commentary explains this in this way, but I will say, I think this doesn't seem convincing to me and I prefer to look at this passage or this idea in a different way. So I say it's helpful to learn the commentaries, but one doesn't have to sign on a dotted line that <laughs> fearing that if you depart from the commentary, somebody is going to report you to the authorities in Colombo or in Bangkok or in uh, Yangon. <laughs> no, I've seen some people say that. We, we've never said you're a slave to the commentaries, Bonte. And you... <laughs> well, uh, Bonte, that's very helpful. So just uh, to kind of summarize, one role of parsing out the uh, word is to almost narrow in on the specific meaning from a more nebulous term. And then uh, kind of expanding in the meaning would be to almost expand back out into the wider context of the teaching and place the term within a wider framework, um, if, if that sounds correct. And I'm curious, um, you know, in terms of the, what do you feel like uh, the modern sort of EBT, early Buddhist text movement, has might lose by putting aside the commentary in that way. I, I know you referenced a sort of internal consistency and wider picture of the teachings, which is very helpful. Um, is, is that the main thing, or are there other other benefits you really gain from from looking into the commentaries in such depth? <laughs> so, so now we have an uh, abbreviation EBT. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think those who adopt the approach of EBT, the early Buddhist text, it, it, in a way it provides an important service or it has an important value since within the Theravada tradition, as, it, as it's come down through the centuries right up to the modern period, there's a tendency to look at the canonical teachings, the Abhidhamma, the commentaries, as forming one perfectly consistent piece and seeing them all as hanging together. You know, it's just part of one perfectly consistent, unquestionable teaching. But the scholars who have worked on the, examining the early Buddhist texts have 
helped us to see the layering, especially within the Theravada tradition, on the one hand, to see the layering of historical periods, different phases of interpretation within the Theravada tradition, and also to appreciate the fact that these early Buddhist texts are not the special preserve of the Theravada teaching, but to recognize that there are parallels, counterparts to probably almost all of the teachings in, in the Sutta Bhittaka, at least in the four main Nikayas, that have been preserved in other the lineages of other early Buddhist schools, Buddhist schools which no longer exist, but their texts have been preserved either in Chinese translation, in some cases in Tibetan translation, in a number of cases in Gandhari, and some in Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. So when we look at these parallel versions of these early Buddhist texts, we could see the common core of the of what seems to have been a single discourse. And also we could see sometimes interesting differences between them. But don't question me about those differences because I haven't specialized in those comparative studies. That would be something for somebody like Bhikkhu Analeo to. Yeah, Bhante, there's a, a really good essay entitled How Early Buddhism Differs from Theravada. It's a checklist that was made by Bhante Sujato where he kind of compares these two things, his his understanding of the early Buddhist texts, his research into that, um, and what he is quite specific elsewhere, what he considers an early Buddhist text um, versus a broader, the Theravada, you know, which includes Abhidhamma and uh, these commentaries. And there are a number of, thing, a number of things in his list, which um, is quite extensive, maybe 40 different items or so. Um, but one thing which he highlights, which I'd be curious to hear your take on is, um, and which I does very much seem to be uh, quite striking is the spirit of inquiry. So you read the earliest Buddhist texts, um, you know, as that's defined, say that in the Majjhima Nikaya, uh, Diga Nikaya uh, Sangyutta Anguttara, and these older, seemingly earlier strata of texts, and the Buddha is asking the monks questions and giving them time to answer. There's the, of course, the Kalama Sutta, which is encouraging people to doubt and ask questions. Whereas now, you know, there, it seems like there's a capital T Theravada, uh, like you were saying, you know, the, the police, you know, I, I don't know too much about the, um, uh, you know, the, the bodies in, in Burma, Myanmar that kind of regulate the orthodox view of things, but uh, it seems like that does exist and um, that the spirit of inquiry, which is, which is there and is encouraged in early texts is kind of stamped down and discouraged. Like there is one right answer and you want to get that. So. I would say that that is, maybe we say that's a feature of cultural Theravada Buddhism. Well, let's say it, oh, maybe not cultural, more institutional Theravada Buddhism. But if you look, say at even at the Vinaya commentaries, well, to some extent, the Sutta commentaries, but maybe more the Vinaya commentaries, they will sometimes, when dealing with a particular point of Vinaya, they will say that, okay, this elder holds, hold this, referring to the, the Puranas, the ancient elders, who were no longer, they, they were not the elders living at the time of Buddhaghosa, but referring to the elders quoted in the now vanished, probably the older commentaries. We'll say this elder held this opinion, but this one held that opinion. And so they'll quote different opinions before the commentator himself, the author of Buddhaghosa, might approve of the opinion of one of those elders rather than the other. So this shows, I think, even centuries, at least several centuries after the time of the Buddha, there were, um, differences of opinion. There were sometimes debates taking place amongst the elders. But it is true that um, particularly in, in Myanmar, more than maybe the other countries, a kind of rather rigid adherence to the position of the commentaries holding that, in fact, <laughs> I remember that the Some Burmese teachers 
quoting the commentary as though it were Buddha Vachana. I don't remember the expression that, that they use. Right, right. I, I'm curious if you yourself use the term early Buddhist texts, and if you do, how you how you define that? Which of which items from the the Mula canon would you include? Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, well, I would say probably those who speak about the early Buddhist texts will put maybe the time limit, perhaps. The time of the time of King Ashoka as representing the latest limit for the early Buddhist texts, perhaps, but certainly they would include the texts of the four, say, in the Pali tradition, the four Nikayas, and then from the Kutaka Nikaya texts like Dhammapada, Udana Itivutaka, Sutta Nipata, Teragata, Terigata. And perhaps a few other texts. I don't know, Peta Vatu, Amphimata Vatu. I don't know if they would include those. Okay, but I think I seem to detect even, I would say, in the Diga Nikaya, which almost invariably would be included in the early Buddhist texts, some of the suttas have a very, very different flavor from that, those, say, in the Sangyutta Nikaya, or the bulk of the suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya. And even in the Anguttara Nikaya, um, you can see some suttas have a somewhat different flavor. You use some terms that are not found in the text say, of the Sangyutta Nikaya or the Majjhima Nikaya. So probably one could speculate if one wants to get critical enough, you could probably posit even layering of suttas within the so-called early Buddhist texts. But if you get skeptical and critical enough before long, I mean, even scholars, I think starting with, not starting with, but including K.R. Norman and some others, um, the Swiss scholar, Johann Brunker questioned whether the Dhamma Chakrabhavatas, Dhamma Chakrabhavatana Sutta can truly be ascribed to the Buddha or whether that was a compilation by the compilers of the text. You know, if you want to get skeptical and critical enough, you, you might be left with just a few verses of the Dhammapada. <laughs> and somebody will come along and say, hey, the meter there is irregular. There's a, a meter typical of the third century BC. So we can't describe those to the Buddha and you don't left with nothing. <laughs> In fact, there's some scholar that has apparently a respected scholar who's publishing in esteemed scholarly journals. I don't remember his name offhand, but he's published a series of articles questioning the historical authenticity of the Buddha himself, questioning whether the Buddha himself was a truly historical figure or just a legendary figure sort of created by when we have to say by a group of Buddhist monks. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I have heard that almost a, a straw man. Well, so in Bhante Analio's book on Buddhist conceits, he makes a very good case against Theravada conceit. And the Theravada conceit that he's speaking of is the conceit of the commentaries. So it's basically. Um, or a, a view of the uh, a type of Theravada that's informed heavily by the commentaries. That was my reading of his, um, his Theravada conceit. But I'm curious if you might be able to speak to, you've spoken about some of the benefits of labeling early Buddhist texts as such, but are there any drawbacks of, say, early Buddhist text essentialism, or is there a risk for early Buddhist text conceit? I think what you indicated is a kind of early Buddhist text conceit. And what we spoke of, what we mentioned just when we began this conversation, this was an idea that was quite widespread amongst the Western monks in Sri Lanka as I encountered them when I first arrived in Sri Lanka. And from time to time, it still probably still crops up. Um, and this is the idea that 
the only thing that you can rely on to understand the Dhamma are the early Buddhist texts. The Abhidhamma is just a scholastic system, philosophical speculation, get rid of it. The commentaries are utterly misleading, get rid of them. Just rely on the early Buddhist texts. Bhante, in terms of um, this layering we're speaking about, um, so it strikes me that there's one particular layer that is more uh, fraught and also fascinating than, than many others, and that's the layering. And it may be even, uh, I think it's probably a misnomer to even call it a layering, but certainly in terms of the chronology of when it came along, it, it was a subsequent iteration, was the Mahayana. Um, and uh, I, I speak of it this way because um, certainly the proponents of the Mahayana or, or those who kind of um, uh, practice in line with it um, do see it as something that was either taught at the time of the Buddha to a certain subset of beings and then came up later. Um, but regardless of something as something that was very much uh, resonant with those early Buddhist teachings and, and maybe even uh, spoke to a wider scope where actually the Arahant ideal is not the ultimate ideal, but here's uh, sort of what the Bodhisattva ideal is and, and that's a, a broader scope. So I am curious, um, you know, how uh, do you see that layer? Um, I think there's obviously a, a huge benefit in, in keeping of just a broad scope of heart. And, uh, you know, we don't know a great deal about the universe. And, um, but I'm curious how you've worked with that dynamic in your own practice and uh, thinking between um, these two schools um, of, of thought. Yeah, that's a very interesting question that I've thought about for quite a long time. First, I think it's incontrovertible that the Mahayana Sutras, as we have them today, and probably even the first layering, uh, let's say the first literary stratum of the Mahayana Sutras, are definitely the product of a later period, because they themselves proclaim refer to writing, to the writing of the sutras. They, they praise the virtues of copying, because we have to remember in those days they were not printed books, so they speak about the virtues of copying out the Mahayana sutras and giving copies, written copies of them to others. And a lot of the ideas in the Mahayana sutras sort of presuppose, I would say, not simply the teachings of the early Buddhist, uh, so-called early Buddhist texts of the Buddhist texts corresponding to the Pali Nikayas, but they presuppose in some of the schemes, you could see the traces of Abhidharma systems within them. But what has always struck me as rather strange and puzzling is that we don't find in the early Buddhist texts anybody coming to the Buddha and saying, I have the aspiration to follow the, the path of the Bodhisattva. You, because it's clear to me that the Buddha is at, at one level, he's an arahant, of course we say, so bhagava arahang, but he's also sama sambuddho. He's the perfectly, completely enlightened one, even if we don't agree with the idea of omniscience, but his knowledge range of comprehension is just vastly superior to that of everybody else. And he has that unique ability to, well, that unique function of establishing the sasana at a period when it's not known in the world, and the ability, those powers of knowledge that enable him to formulate the teaching and present it exactly in the way that suits the dispositions, interests, capacities of others. Whereas even Sariputta, as we see in the suttas, makes mistakes in that regard. So the Buddha seems to me to be at a, at a quite unique and special level, towering above even the greatest of the arhats. And yet we don't see in the suttas anybody coming to the Buddha and expressing that aspiration and saying, please, Bhante, give me some guidance to follow that path. And I just don't know the, the answer why that is missing. <laughs> 
you know, I've speculated actually in a paper that perhaps the Buddha did give some instructions to those who expressed that aspiration, but the dominant ideal at the time was to gain liberation. And so that was the ideal pursued by the vast majority of the disciples. And so that became the dominant, uh, or that became the ideal that informed the formulation of the suttas. But maybe that pursuit of a bodhisattva path sort of remained below the surface and quietly developed in its own way until it inserted itself into the mainstream schools and then led to the separate um, to the emergence of Mahayana as a separate form of Buddhism. Bhante, that's fascinating. And one um, line of inquiry I'd really like just to, to touch briefly there is uh, I've heard the two concepts of the Bodhisattva path discussed or the concept of Bodhisattva path discussed um, as uh, in two ways, basically, where in the Theravada, one makes a vow, and then I believe in the commentaries, especially, it's a vow that has to be made in front of a previous Buddha, although, honestly, I'm, I'm skeptical of that aspect. Um, and that sort of keeps one from attaining enlightenment, and therefore one can build, build paramita. Then in the Mahayana, it seems there was a very different conception where one can actually achieve a state wherein someone, one is effectively enlightened or at least in some transcendent state apart from samsara and yet at the same time resting in a sort of sunyata emptiness where one still can almost, you know, I know they speak about bodhisattvas splitting off pieces of their mind and basically sending them down as uh, incarnations. And that concept is, is fascinating. Um, it speaks to a very wide and variegated world that I was not aware of. It also seems to uh, variegated, very colorful. Um, yeah, but 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 it also seems to maybe conflict with the idea of nibbana as the cessation of being, or you know, a bhava. Uh, so, what is your thinking on those two models? Um, yes. Okay, it seems to me that first, what is spoken of within. Wait, let me just backtrack a little bit. So I was speaking about how it could be sort of that under the surface of mainstream Buddhism, there was in a, a tacit bodhisattva ideal being understood by some and pursued by some. And we see even in a stratum of the Theravada canonical texts or texts that were included in the canon, that the Theravada, the Bodhisattva ideal started to become manifest within the Theravada school itself. The two texts that exemplify that, possibly three, possibly four, <laughs> actually, are the Buddha Vangsa, which gives the story of <clears throat> how the being who has become our Buddha, Gautama Buddha, back many, many aeons ago, formulated his original vow in the presence of Dipankara Buddha, and then rece received the Vyakarana, the prediction of future success from Dipankara. Yeah. And then it tells of his incarnations from that time till the time he achieves Buddhahood as Gautama Buddha. And then there's the Charya Bitaka, which includes some kind of Jataka type stories. And then there is the Jataka collection itself, of which only the verses of, are canonical, but the stories must have been in some form accompanying the verses. And then we have the um, Upadana also gives to some extent, it focuses more on the background stories of the disciples. But what it shows, I think the Upadana is that those who achieve liberation in a particular life, whether as the fully enlightened Buddha, as the Pacheka Buddhas, or as the Arahat disciples, go through a long period of preparatory training over many, many lives, which we don't see in the in the canonical or in the main Nikayas. So this seems to be filling in what I would call the long-term cosmic background 
to the attainments that are recorded in the in the Nikayas themselves. Okay, so now coming back to your question. <clears throat> okay, what is stated about or stipulated about the requirements for becoming a bodhisattva in that particular passage in the Theravada text? I think the first one is the Buddha Vangsa, and then it's repeated in the commentaries. That I see, I see is a requirement to receive the prediction from the Buddha, the, the assurance that, one, that one's aspiration is going to succeed in the future. But this is where I see maybe this would be some convergence with the Mahayana point of view, that the being who is to get the prediction from the Buddha has to be practicing on a bodhisattva path over maybe millions of lives before reaching that point because it's said that they have to have easy access to the eight samapattis and to have their faculties mature enough so that if they aspire to arahatship, just I think with a four line verse, or maybe it's two lines of a four line verse, they could achieve arahatship with the full slate of abhinyas right on the spot. Okay, but from the Theravada perspective, even the Bodhisattva who gets the prediction doesn't have a direct realization of Nibbana. The realization of Nibbana only comes pretty much while, while they're sitting at the seat of the Bodhi tree, of their Bodhi tree, on the night of their attainment of enlightenment. That's when the last traces of ignorance are removed, and that's when the Nibbanic experience takes place. I think within the Mahayana, you know, I don't know all of the subtle details, and there are different schools. I'm sure that there are like about half a dozen different schools of interpretation within the Mahayana, but I think the dominant view, let me just see, is that there's this, you know, the 10, there are 10 Bodhisattva stages, so I think it's either at the sixth or at the tenth stage that the bodhisattva then becomes irreversible. And at that point, if they wanted to, they could, at that point, if they wanted to, they could realize our hardship. But because of their vows, they don't realize our hardship, but then go on to the could be to the stages from seven to 10 or the stages nine and 10. I don't remember the details. Well, this is fascinating. Um, when you were visiting and teaching at the Dharma Realm Buddhist University this past spring, um, I asked you a similar question to what, what we're speaking on now. It's like, how do you reconcile some of these seeming differences between a, a Orthodox Theravada view and an Orthodox Mahayana view? Specifically, you just mentioned, uh, I mean, in certain Mahayana understandings, the Buddha was already enlightened, uh, you know, when he was born or, or yeah, you know, he was, is just performative under the Bodhi tree or this mention that maybe Arhats or Buddhas can exist after death. Or, or I mentioned in some Mahayana sutras, there's reference to the true self, you know, which is very different from the Anatta. And I asked you, how do you reconcile this? And you thought about it for a second. And you just said, I guess just with the don't know mind. <laughs> and, and, and then I thought about that and I said, that is, that is fascinating. And then I kept thinking about it a little bit more. And I, I said, um, that seems, you know, to be somewhat of a, you know, a, a Zen concept, like the Zen mind, beginner's mind. Bhante, how would you translate uh, don't know mind into Pali? And your response? I, I don't think I said, maybe I said, I don't think I said don't know mind intending that in the Zen sense. Maybe what I said is, I just don't know. <laughs> or maybe what I said, I just can't reconcile them. Because it seems to me that what was happening, in some of the, this would be particularly in the stream after the division of the early Buddhist community, in the stream that turned into the Mahasangika school, 
even before the emergence of the Mahayana, that there came a kind of reluctance to accept the full humanity of the Buddha. Perhaps one could speculate that this was a little bit of Brahminic, the theistic modes of thought. You know, it's rather interesting. You know, we have texts like the Bhagavad Gita of Hinduism, which becomes Hinduism, and texts like the Lotus Sutra of Mahayana Buddhism existing side by side. And there seem to be such striking similarities between them in certain respects. And yet I've never seen a scholarly study of an attempt to track influences from one to the other, or way maybe both have emerged from similar strains, developments taking place in early Indian thought. Like we have, okay, in the Lotus Sutra, which is what pretty much what you were referring to, the idea that the Buddha had really attained enlightenment aeons and aeons ago in the past. And when we see the Buddha taking birth, going through the uncertainties of childhood, getting married and having a child, renouncing the world, struggling for through the ascetic practices, not knowing which way to turn to gain enlightenment, and finally finding the way and gaining enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. All of this is part of the Buddha's lila. You know, we have the work, the lila vistara, the story of the, div we could say even the divine play of the Buddha. Sort of it's part of his upaya, his skillful means for guiding the ignorant ordinary people by even though he's already enlightened, by showing that he takes the form of an ordinary deluded being to encourage us. <laughs> so we have that in the strain of Buddhism. Then in Hinduism, we have the charioteer. This is in the Bhagavad Gita, the charioteer. And then finally, in the Lotus Sutra, was it chapter 15 or 16, the Buddha reveals his true nature there comes the scene, I think it's chapter 15, where the earth breaks open and millions of bodhisattvas emerge from the earth. I don't know if you're familiar with the Lotus Sutra. And then they stand in front of the Buddha, venerating him. And the assembly is all astonished. How is this possible that you've just lived a lifespan? Now you are close to the age of 80 and you have these millions of bodhisattvas venerating venerating you. <laughs> and that's followed by the chapter on the boundless lifespan of the Buddha, where he, he then reveals that he didn't attain enlightenment in that life, but millions of aeons ago. And all of this display of the struggle, striving, was just part of his skillful, skillful means to guide and transform deluded beings. Yeah, and then in the Bhagavad Gita, we have Krishna appears as the charioteer of Arjuna and giving him advice and giving him sort of instruction, just like an ordinary human being, an instructor. Then in one of the late chapters, it might also be chapter 15 of the Bhagavad Gita, which is it's not fresh in my mind. But then Krishna reveals his true form to Arjuna, in which he takes on a million different forms to the point where Arjuna is completely you know, amazed and struck with terror and horror so that he can't take it anymore. And then he pleads with Krishna, please return to your ordinary peaceful form. Yeah, so it seems that there could be like strains of Indian thought that couldn't accept the historic, the historical human reality of the Buddha, which then that strain could have emerged in the Maha, Mahasangika idea that, in fact, we get these ideas that the body of the Buddha is boundless. The, life, the Buddha's lifespan is infinite. The Buddha's virtues are, or the Buddha's light spreads everywhere through the universe. That the real Buddha is always in samadhi and that the Buddha that appears 
in this world, going on alms round, teaching, falling asleep, um, you know, that, that Buddha is just the kind of emanation or projection of the eternal Buddha, which is always absorbed in samadhi. How to reconcile that? <laughs> I, I don't know, but I, I feel more comfortable with a historical human Buddha. <laughs> yeah, if somebody wants to do it, I, that's, I, I know you picked out your dissertation theme, but if you find a fellow student at, this, at the Dharma realm who wants a good topic to explore. Yeah, that would be great. I will definitely look for someone. I remember when I asked you the question about the don't know mind, how I remembered the story, you gave a very Zen response. I said, Bhante, how would you translate don't know mind into Pali? And at first you gave a very funny response. You just said, avijja, like just ignorance. Then you said, wait, it, it's investigation. So like, it could be, yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay. It was a yeah, beautiful teaching. And yeah, I, it, it, I think it takes a lot to be able to hold both of these um, seeming contradictions and um, yeah, at some point, I, I would love to hear more about your insights and how you do that because you've been living in a Mahayana monastery for over twenty years. Not only that, but I give regular, regularly. I give every year the Dharma talk on. We have two ceremonies: the Dharma talk on the enlightenment of <laughs> Avalokit or Kuan Yin Bodhisattva, but it's not the it's not the is it. Dung Jung Dung Zui. It's not the complete enlightenment corresponding to the Buddha. It's actually in Chinese. It's Zhang Dao, the attainment of the way. Or as you say, the realization of the truth. And then that comes. It's actually coming this weekend. <laughs> and then in the fall, at the October, it's the Dhamma talk on the renunciation of Kuan Yin Bodhisattva. Quentin Bodhisattva's Chujia going into homelessness. So I always ask the nuns, I say, but we don't see Quan Yin with a shaved head wearing monastic robes. What do you say for that, Monte? How do you uh, approach those two talks? What I do is try to bring in, to start off with the canonical text on, because what the text that will be recited is the it's called the Universal Gate Chapter of the Lotus Sutra, Puman Pin. So I start off with the description of Avalokiteshvara or Kuan Yin there. And then I try to bring in like fundamental Buddhist ideas, Buddhist, Buddhist values, and sort of connect it in that way. So Bhante, in terms of grounding things and, and connecting these beautiful, um, but also uh, somewhat ethereal or conceptual thoughts to, to life. Um, who, I'm just curious, looking back through your own life, I mean, you've lived as a monk for so many years now. I'm curious, honestly, two things. Um, I'm curious about the, maybe one or two of the interactions you've had with, with beings who have really touched you or moved you the most in your years as a monk, like those interactions which have kind of glowed in you over these many decades. Um, and then I would be, well, that might be enough, but I, I am also curious about what you've seen that helps keep monastics in robes. What, what's the one quality that you know, you, you'd advise or, or recollection you'd give us? So those are two gigantic questions, but I'm very interested in both. Okay, I'd say the people who have like most affected me, I'd say, in Sri Lanka, maybe two or three monks that I was associated with, perhaps more, but one is my ordination teacher. This is Balangoda Ananda Maitreya. He was an elder Sri Lankan monk who, the way I connected with him, I was actually, I was originally ordained as a novice in the Vietnamese Mahayana system when I was in graduate school at Claremont Graduate University. Then a monk from Vietnam came to study in the same university. And I looked to him as my first Buddhist teacher. And then I became ordained as a novice in the Vietnamese system. But then later, when I, a few years later, when I was still living in the Los Angeles area, then I met a Sri Lankan monk, Venerable Piyadasi, 
Okay, that's the Mahatera. And um, yeah, so I attended his talks and I actually I drove him around Los Angeles. And then when we parted, then he said, someday you should come to Sri Lanka. I can arrange for you to stay at a Buddhist monastery. He actually said, come to Ceylon, because at that time the country was still called Ceylon in 1971. So then the next year I decided I wanted to switch over to the Theravada system. So I wrote to Venerable Piyadasi, and then he connected me to this elder Sri Lankan monk, Balangoda Ananda Maitreya, who's, then I wrote to Venerable Ananda Maitreya, and he invited me or welcomed me to come to his temple in Sri Lanka. And so I came there and I studied with him. My first few years were spent at his temple studying with him. And he was the one who emphasized to me the importance of learning the Pali commentaries. He said, you know, after I was reading the suttas, he said, you should read the commentaries. They're really wonderful, really wonderful. If you want to understand the, <laughs> if you want, want to understand the Dhamma, you have to understand the commentaries. And then he took, I think one of the first texts he took for me to read was <laughs> the Burmese Lady Soyador's commentary on the Abhidhamata Sangha. <laughs> Sangha. <laughs> and gave it to me and said, read this, <laughs> which was f quite difficult. But I did struggle to read, to read through parts of it in Burmese script. He actually told me when I went to study with him, he told me, learn the Burmese script. Don't bother to learn the Singhali script. Because he had been, he participated in the sixth great council in, in Myanmar. And so the, the when it was published in Burmese script, the, the Burmese Sangha, they sent him the entire six council edition with the canonical text, the commentaries and the tikas, the sub-commentaries. <clears throat> and so he had all of those texts in his library and so he told me, he urged me to learn the, the uh, Burmese script first. Later, I did learn the Singhali script. But he would give me the text in the Burmese script to read. And, you know, we spent yeah, quite some time. He went through the Abhidhamata Sangaha with me, and he would refer to the explanations of Lady Soyador. And even though Lady Soyador criticized the older commentary on the Abhidhamata Sangaha by a, I think it was probably a Sri Lankan commentator, Vibhavani Tika, I don't remember the name of the author of that, but Ananda Maitreya liked the commentary by Lady Soyador. And uh, yeah, another thing that really impressed me about Venerable Ananda Maitreya. He was very, very simple, very humble. Even at that time that I went to stay with him, he was the Maha Nayakatero of the Amarapura Nikaya, which means the Maha Nayakatero is like the the chief uh, chief prelate. It would be roughly like an archbishop in the Catholic Church. And yet he was very, very simple. He just had his kudi with just like the barest, uh, barest requisites. Um, didn't have any kind of pretense, any interest in titles, honors, position. And <laughs> yeah, they, they elected him as the Mahanikaya, Mahanayakatero of the Amarapur Nikaya. I think it was a term of five years. And then in 1976, he came up, he could have been reelected for a second term, but he, he decided <laughs> one term is enough. I don't want it anymore. And then he turned it over to a, a, an election for somebody else to replace him. And his greatest happiness was to be like deeply immersed in his study. And he did a, a fair amount of translation of the 
Pali of Pali texts into the Sinhalese language for the Buddha Jayanti Tripitaka series. Yeah, so that was the person's first formative influence on me. And the other, the person that I looked to pretty much as my, I call my real as my mentor in the monk's life, was the German monk, Venerable Nyanaponika Mahatera. So I stayed, I would go when I was living in Balagoda, I went from time to time to Kandy to stay with Venerable Nyanaponika. You know, just for short periods, a few weeks, maybe once a month or so. And then I'd gone to India in 1975. And then, of course, the India would not extend the visas of the West, of the Americans in India. There were tense relations between India and the United States at that time. So India wouldn't renew my visa. So I decided to go back to Sri Lanka. And then Venerable Nyanaponika invited me to come to stay at his place in Kandy. So I stayed with him then for about a year and a half. Then I went back to the US. And then I went back to Sri Lanka in 1982. But then in 1980, and I stayed with Venerable Nyanaponika for that first Vasa, the Vasa of 1982. Then in 1984, I realized I was staying at another monastery, but I realized that Venerable Nyanapunika was now getting old and he was alone in the forest hermitage. And so I decided that I should go and stay with him. And so I went to the forest hermitages and I stayed with him. And then at that time, he was the editor of the Buddhist Publication Society. And when I went to stay with him, I told him that I'll come to stay with you, but as long as you're alive, I won't be the editor for the Buddhist Publication Society. So I went to stay with him. Then two months, a month later, two months later, he said, we're having a board meeting tomorrow. I'm going to tell the board that I'm appointing you the editor of the Buddhist publications. <laughs> I said, wait, you promised me. <laughs> and he said, no, I can't do it anymore. I'm 83 years old and I'm losing my sight. Yeah, so I stayed with him for 10, 10 actually the 10 and a half years, right up to his death in 1994. Do you have a, a memory you can give us of him? One thing that he said, it was always impressed me. He said, it's always better to err on the side of kindness rather than on the side of force and anger. Thank you. You, you embody that well, Bhante. And, and on that note, Bhante, do you have... Um, advice, what, what advice would you, you know, what have you seen that's kept monastics in robes and what would you, advice would you give young monastics like, like ourselves? Well, at this point, you're a bit young, but still, I don't think you're such young monks. But what I'd say is that it's important to really to learn the Dhamma. And this is maybe where I'm a bit critical of maybe contemporary trends in among Western monastics, they think that when you get ordained as a monk, it means you just have the opportunity to plunge into full-time meditation and it's not meditating very vigorously. And maybe there will be a few who have that kind of temperament where they could see, can, where they can succeed with that. But I say what's important at the outset is to establish secure foundations and we know the Buddha says there's a sutta where a monk comes to the Buddha, apparently a junior monk, and says, Bhante, please teach me the Dhamma so that I can go off into seclusion. And then the Buddha says, first you have to purify the starting point in wholesome Dhammas. And what is that starting point in wholesome Dhammas? He says, purified sila and right view. So first you have to, of course, you have to learn the Vinaya and sort of get a secure foundation in the Vinaya. And then you have to get, I would say, a clear view, a comprehensive view of the Dhamma. Of course, it's that broad view, the view that this the practice is not just a matter of immediate uh, success, just throwing yourself into it quickly and urgently, hoping to get immediate success, but you have to see the value of the monastic life in the long range against this 
samsaric background and the distant samsaric future. And so you have to see the monastic life gives this rather very precious opportunity to build up these strong qualities. And it has to be, as the Buddha says in so many suttas, an anupuba sika, a sequential training, a se se sequential practice. And then also I say what's really important in monastic life, and this is something I didn't really have so much myself, and that is kalyana mitata, having good friends in the sense of having not only a good teacher, but having good friends roughly in your own age group. Like when I lived as a monk in Sri Lanka in Balangoda, I was pretty much all alone. I had my teacher, Venerable Ananda Maitreya, who was 50 years older than me. And the other monks at the monastery were all samaneras, uh, well, samaneras as young boys from the ages of like 10, 12, 14. I think the oldest was 15. When I was 28, he was 15, the oldest. So I couldn't be friends with them. But Bhante, you speak of, uh, you mentioned the importance of the Anupubi, uh, un Anupubika Sikha, the, uh, the, sometimes translated as the gradual training. And I'm, I'm clear, curious if, I mean, there are some formulations, certainly in Tibetan Buddhism, perhaps with some ways that Dzogchen is, is related and some ways that um, Chan or, or Zen Buddhism or, or portrayed uh, of being, actually, it's not really a gradual path. It's, it's an instantaneous um, instantaneous awakening right now. Um, and, you know, I've heard a, a Theravada perspective that it's gradual until it's instantaneous and then you attain Arhantship or, you know, Sotapanna. Um, but is there any way of understanding Theravada that does allow for this Satorai or this um, immediacy of, uh, yeah, both an immediate and a gradual path? Um, yeah, prior to perhaps uh, sotapanna or um, on a different, in, in a different way? Certainly attainment when it occurs comes instantaneously in that now you, at this point you haven't gotten it, then it's sort of like in a snap of a fingers, then you get it. And there are cases recorded, of course, in the suttas where you see that it's pretty much somebody just encounters the Dhamma for the first time. And as soon as they hear a certain key phrase, key expression, it's enough to make that breakthrough. What I would say is that in those cases, that person has been, maybe already has accumulations from past lives so that there's already a kind of accumulation of tendencies of maybe mature paramis just under the surface just waiting to emerge and then they have a very in this present life they have a very strong spirit of inquiry so they've been seeking searching maybe these are like ascetics who have been wandering from teacher to teacher asking, how is it? What is this? What is the way? What is the path? What is the truth? Until they meet the Buddha or like the disciple of the Buddha, and then they hear the teaching, and then that's enough to break through that kind of what in Zen they call the great doubt, which is not the doubt of Ichikicha, but it's the doubt of that spirit of inquiry. Yeah, so that I think would be the counterpart. And so even the sudden, what they call the sudden awakening in Zen, like maybe there are some accounts like Hui Neng, the sixth patriarch, was just, he was working, selling something in the market, and then he heard somebody walking by reciting the Diamond Sutra, and then he had a breakthrough. But he already had sort of, we call the accumulations to become the sixth patriarch. But probably, like in most Zen monasteries, you know, they're str str struggling, practicing like six, eight, ten hours of meditation a, a day <laughs> until at some point maybe the master will hit them with the stick or say something, and then they have the sudden awakening. But it's, you know, it's not like they've been living a life of 
as a business executive enjoying themselves, and then they come to the Zen monastery and then sit down for their first session of meditation, and then they have the great breakthrough. And I think with Dog Chen, I don't really know that much about it, but I imagine that it comes at the end of, I think in the classical Tibetan, now it's sort of been popularized and spread widely, but I believe like in the old Tibetan tradition, you have to go through you know, the training and roughly would be the Nyingma counterpart of the Gelugpa Lam Rim. You learn, go through all of the training and the path, learning the would correspond to the Shravaka teachings and the generation of Bodhicitta, then learning the Paramis and studying Madhyamaka, Yogacara, whatever. Then you do some of the early preliminary tantric practices. And then if the teacher thinks you're qualified, then maybe they'll give you the Dzogchen teaching or Mahamudra, whatever. But I'm not, I'm not an expert on that. You have to ask somebody else about that. Maybe just one final question is um, about the importance of meeting and studying with uh, actual Arya Pugala. I'm curious about your own uh, your own experience and also just how in, important that is. I mean, just disclosure. I I do believe um, you know it's reading the biography of Ajahn Mun. I do believe he was a uh, an Arya Pugala, and I believe I've met other people who are noble beings. And I'm curious what role that's played in your life and what role you feel it it can play or should play in a practitioner's life. Yeah, I don't make judgments about anybody that I've met personally, whether they're Arya Pugalas or not. Um, I think it would be certainly an advantage if you encounter somebody who <clears throat> has some kind of abhinya, ability to know your state of mind, maybe not the necessarily the ability to know every, all your thoughts, but to be able to see into your anus, <coughs> anusias, asaya and anusias, your tendencies, your underlying dispositions, and then is able to give you the instructions, especially for practice, that correspond to your inclinations and tendencies. The teachers that I've studied with, particularly in the sphere of meditation, pretty much are those who have a relatively like fixed systems of teaching rather than variable systems of teaching. So I did have the benefit when I was in Sri Lanka of practicing with a teacher at, at that time. It was called Nisaranavaniya Amita Regala. His name was Venerable Sri Jnana Rama. And he was very, very skilled teacher. I don't make any judgments about level of attainment, but he was able, when I would report my experiences, then to give me very precise and helpful guidance on moving on to the next stage in practice. But I think this was because he was teaching within a framework. This would be the framework of the insight knowledges rather than you know, looking into my mind and then seeing what are the particular weaknesses and tendencies that I have to overcome. Thank you, Bonte, and um, just your, your own guidance uh, whenever we've gotten to speak with you. And I know Ajahn Kobilo has spent a long, long time with you, or some time with you. Not enough. Um, it's, always, it's always really appreciated, Bonte, and for all you've done for us in the Buddhist world, in the robes, um, just such deep gratitude and if we ever get a chance for you to come by seattle we will be honored um but in the meantime we just wish you all, all the best in, in in health and dhamma and, and everything and are, are deeply grateful we can just say thank you okay thank you so much yeah